that it is a key conundrum in life that a lot of societies coming out of vicious internal conflicts have to face. And this is indeed one that we face in Sri Lanka at the present moment. And our tutelage is a culture of impunity that obtains in respect of human rights violations that have been committed over decades, but also in particular with regard to egregious human rights violations committed over the last decade, for which we did set up a commission of inquiry to which was attached an independent international group of eminent persons. Unfortunately, that group threw up its hands in despair and left saying that there wasn't a political commitment to search for the truth. And that commission of inquiry's report submitted to the president has not been made public. And the cases that they looked at are ineffectively stalled. Uh, there has been no particular response. Also, it's, I think, only fair to say that there is a certain climate of fear and restraint in terms of public debate and deliberation because of the way in which there was a certain amount of repression at the time of the war that continues insofar as public discourse has been very much dichotomized into discourse between traitors and patriots. And there is, as a consequence, considerable self-censorship by a media that saw itself targeted to the extent that something like 12 journalists were killed and over 20 have fled the country and live in exile. So that whole question of reversing the culture of impunity, trying to found a unity upon reconciliation, which in turn is founded upon accountability. The issue of a political settlement to be able to have a unity in which every citizen, irrespective of ethnicity or any other difference, feels part of the entire establishment. And also, the much more practical and mundane, but tremendously important issue of people being able to go home and being able to regain livelihoods. Now, let me say at the outset that I feel very strongly that our government at the present moment does not see these things in these terms. The perspective that the government has is one in which it projects economic development as an overarching priority. From my perspective, I think it over-prioritizes economic development, and the argument is somewhat along these lines, that we will pursue economic development with the same single-mindedness single of purpose and determination as we did the defeat of terrorism. In doing that, therefore, questions of rights, in particular civil and political rights, are irrelevant at best or subversive at worst. Economic development is therefore being projected as some kind of panacea to move from past into future without having to go through that tortuous process of reckoning, of accountability, of responsibility, indeed, of establishing the truth. Now, this is not the first time that in Sri Lanka we've had a regime that has projected economic development as being the overarching priority of the day. In 1977, when we opened up our economy, we moved from a structure of governance which was very much the Westminster style structure of governance to an executive presidency on the grounds that economic development was the most important thing for the country Economic development requires, in fact demands, a strong center, a strong executive, and therefore we vested inordinate powers in the office of the executive presidency, the first incumbent of that office very famously remarking that the only thing he couldn't do was to change the sex of an individual. 
We did that in 1978, promulgated an executive presidency on the basis that economic development was the overarching priority requiring this. And within that decade, we had two insurgencies, one in the south and the other in the north. And unfortunately, I think the current regime hasn't learned the lesson of that historical example of as to whether a very restrictive and authoritarian executive justified on the basis of economic development nevertheless becomes a source of conflict in itself that leads to armed rebellion and bloodshed. Marx's warnings about history repeating itself notwithstanding, I think this is something that our current regime really needs to look at as to whether in Sri Lanka, a country which has been exercising the franchise for the last 70 odd years, changing governments, a flawed yet formal democracy, as to whether the argument about suspending rights or relegating civil and political rights to a second place will work in a country like that. In this respect, there is an extent to which the political project at one level, in terms of the challenge of reconciliation and a post-conflict phase, is being pursued by the government very much in terms of changing our polity from a rather rambunctious, boisterous, South Asian polity with all its flaws to a more disciplined, homogenized, East Asian polity, where the emphasis is very much upon economic development first and everything else follows. So there is a certain irony in this respect in that Sri Lanka, which in the 50s and 60s used to be referred to as a kind of model parliamentary democracy, may well be changing completely into a much more authoritarian, disciplined polity pursuing economic development above all else. Now, this particular project is also, in my opinion, compounded by one other very South Asian characteristic, and that is, of course, the dynastic project. We are, in effect, a country that is ruled, and I use that term purposely, by three brothers. One is president, the other is Minister of Economic Development, which encompasses everything from mega development projects in the north and east to tourism and whatever else. And the other is the secretary to the Ministry of Defense, the Minister of Defense being the president, who oversees an entire security apparatus forged during the war and institutionalized now in the post-war period. If one looks at the budget which has just been passed, the largest chunk of money goes to defense. The three brothers, in effect, control about 70% of the resources of the country in terms of their ministries. I might also add that the Ministry of Defense also deals with the Urban Development Authority and it also is responsible for the registration and conduct of non-governmental organizations. So there is a very authoritarian framework which underpins this dynastic project, projecting economic development. Is it going to succeed? Currently, after the end of the war, we have registered figures in terms of growth at roughly 8%. The plan is to make Sri Lanka an economic hub in Asia. In order to do that, most conservative estimates suggest that one would have to have growth rates double digit, roughly 12%. What we are not getting is foreign direct investment. And we are not getting foreign direct investment because the profile of the country isn't as promising as it should be for that level of investment. 
problems with regard to governance, with regard to transparency and the rule of law, and also, indeed, the profile in terms of the accusations of war crimes and the culture of impunity also does impact on this. In addition to that, the government has passed legislation which gives it greater control over economic resources, but which will also scare investors. Only the other day, rushed as urgent in the national interest was a bill that identified 37 economic enterprises as underperforming and underutilized, which are to be taken over by the government. The sanctity of investors in terms of a rule of law, in terms of a contract made, has obviously been impacted by legislation of this nature. So without that foreign direct investment, the economic dream, as it were, which is going to be the panacea to move the country away from the memories of hurt and harm that happened over the last three decades, may well not materialize. And there is the fear that we go back to the future. The government's success so far has been in capitalizing on the global shift, sorry, the shift in the global balance of power towards Asia and towards the, towards the BRIC countries as opposed to the West. If you look at Sri Lanka today, there is an emphasis on infrastructure and tourism. It is fueled by Chinese loans, considerable Chinese loans, and Indian grants. The rest of it is what we borrow in the international capital markets with huge indebtedness and a current account deficit of roughly around 5 billion US dollars. So, in terms of the challenge of governance, in terms of the framework within which economic prosperity is to be pursued, I think we have an example in Sri Lanka where you can't differentiate and divorce the two and assume that one must follow the other. Adam Smith, after all, did write the wealth of nations, the principles of political economy. Economics cannot trump politics no more than politics can trump economics. They have to be seen as complementary halves of a whole and any sustainable strategy, I think, for economic development needs to take on board the fact that they need to reinforce each other and complement each other. Otherwise, there will be problems. I will end with a single anecdote of a gentleman from Jaffna in the north of Sri Lanka who was asked the question, what is it like in Jaffna now? And he turned around and said, things look better, but they feel worse. That is the challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Saravanamudu. Uh, I think that what holds this particular session together is the sense that there may be something to be learned in comparison between experiences of agrarian societies urbanizing, seeking economic development, and at the same time ex attempting to experiment with or preserve democratic institutions. Uh, the role of our next speaker, Professor Andrew Walker, is to give a Southeast Asian perspective on this particular theme, which does, I think, give us some unified discussion this afternoon. Um, Professor Walker is particularly appropriate for this because he edits a blog called New Mandala, which if you haven't encountered and have any interest in this region, you perhaps uh, would enjoy and profit from. The blog, which he's run now for about five years with a colleague, uh, gives them a unique opportunity to test the intellectual waters of this region because they get a lot of unsolicited contributions on issues that are deemed to be too hot for local media to handle. Consequently, he brings not just his own expertise in grassroots politics in Thailand, but also rather a, a good perspective, I think a very helpful perspective, on the region as a whole and democratic issues in it. So with that, uh, I'll ask uh, Professor Walker to address his corruption, democracy, and the rise of political society, a perspective from Thailand. Thank you, Robin. Um, and thank you to ISAS for having me here. It's a great pleasure. 
Um, as Robin said, I'm going to be focusing on, on Thailand, um, but I certainly think there's issues that, that resonate in other countries of Southeast Asia and also in countries of South Asia. So I hope there's some issues that, that you can take up later in the questions. Um, anyone who knows anything about Thailand will know that um, democracy in Thailand is often seen as being synonymous with, with corruption. Um, that there's a common feeling that democracy in Thailand has been subverted by the power of money. And this is reflected in, in the rise of businessmen, politicians, um, in the buying of MPs to form parties or to form government coalitions, and in personal enrichment um, by politicians, especially ministers. And I suppose if there's one person who sums up um, some of these concerns, it's this, this good-looking fellow, um, Thaksin, Thaksin Shinawat, who was Prime Minister of Thailand from 2001 to 2006. And for many people, he, he typifies money politics and, and corruption. And, and his corruption is often cited as, as a primary reason for his being overthrown in, in a political coup, in a military coup um, of 2006. Um, but of course, Thaksin might not be back, but Shinawats are back, and, and his sister, Yingluck, um, is now Prime Minister, having won in, in the last election in, in July. And during that election, there was this extraordinary example of, of the discourse of corruption in Thailand that was waged by anti-Thaksin forces. Um, it was a campaign against the idea of elected politicians altogether, um, condemning, in a sense, all elected politicians as, as being corrupt. And for those of you who don't read Thai, um, the, the slogan is there, don't let animals into parliament. Um, now, this, this is pretty strong language and these are pretty strong images. Um, this is a very powerful discourse of, of corruption. Today, I, I want to focus on one specific aspect of corruption in Thailand, and it's an aspect that's often seen as going to the heart, to the, to the very foundations of the problems with, with Thai democracy. And, and, and that is the, the issue of vote buying. And, and vote buying is often seen as typifying, at, at its very electoral core, um, the power of money politics in the Thai democratic system. So Thailand's famous for many things. One of the things it's almost also famous for is vote buying. Just do a bit of Googling on vote buying and, and see how regularly Thailand pops up. Um, here's, here's some few examples from various research reports and scholarly papers. Um, in, in 1996 election, um, one, one survey found that a third of households were, were offered vote buying. Um, the average per household was 678 baht, um, and the, the amount nationwide was 3 billion baht. And the researchers conclude this is probably an underestimate. Um, jump forward to 2001, Thaksin, the first election Thaksin Shinawat won, and there was a feeling that this was one of the dirtiest elections um, Thailand's ever had. Um, sponsored holidays abroad, paying farmers inflated, price, inflated prices for their crops, generous donations at mock funeral services, whatever a mock funeral service is, I don't know. Um, here we're talking about not 3 billion baht, but 20 billion baht, um, which is just about one of those banknotes, a 500 baht banknote for every voter in Thailand. Um, reports that in the next election, the Thaksin landslide of 2005, even more, 25 billion baht spent nationally. Um, and in the last election, even, even more disturbing developments um, with reports that elderly male voters are being wooed with the little blue pill um, to treat sexual dysfunction at social functions, um, or sexual function at social dysfunctions, I'm not sure. Um, um, so th this, this is a, seen as a sign as, of the inventiveness um, of, of the vote buyers in Thailand, actually distributing Viagra um, in exchange for votes. Now, a lot of these concerns about vote buying um, are focused on rural people. Um, the rural electorate in Thailand is very large and, and very influential, um, and they are often seen as being particularly vulnerable to, to vote buying. And this is part of a long-standing discourse in Thailand, which has essentially said that, that rural people, farmers, peasants, aren't quite yet ready for democracy. 
Um, not sure when they ever will be ready, but, but it's not quite yet. Um, and explanations about their, their susceptibility to corruption and vote buying fall very generally in, into two broad categories, and I'm going to describe these in quite simple terms. The first set of explanations we might call the not modern enough explanations. And these explanations say that, that these farmers are, are mired in poverty, ignorance, and old-fashioned relations of patronage. Um, as it says here, um, vote buying in electoral politics has often been attributed to traditional village culture and rural ignorance. Um, and here, here's one academic analysis of this, which talks about Thailand's electocracy, electocracy, not its democracy, um, and it says at the base of this you have all these poor, ignorant, exploited rural people who have really no other alternative but to sell their votes to the local political patrons for money, jobs, protection or welfare benefits. So they're not modern enough. They're, they're trapped in what, what Gellner called, um, in a sense, the tyranny of cousins. Um, they haven't yet moved out of these, these closed village relationships of patronage um, to become modern democratic citizens. Um, so how do we solve this problem? If they're not modern enough, obviously the way to solve the problem is to make rural people more modern. Um, and in a very, very much quoted analysis by a Thai political science scientist, he said that the, the way we solve this problem, to realise fully its quest for a virtuous democracy, the middle class must actively support rural development that will turn patronage-ridden villages into small towns of middle class farmers or well-paid workers. So let's make these not modern enough farmers a little bit more modern and then they'll embrace the, the middle class virtues of, of non-corrupt democracy. The trouble is there's, there's another discourse, um, and this other discourse is, is not saying that they're, they're not modern enough, it's saying that they're susceptible to vote buying and corruption because they're too modern. Um, and this, this is an example, this is an image from a, a royal, royalist publication in Thailand which, are, which is a fairy tale about various aspects of rural life. And in this particular incident we have, we have this demon, um, the demon of greed. Um, which is seducing rural people by the extravagance of the city. Um, and, and in this discourse, people are vulnerable to democratic corruption and, and vote buying because they've lost their sense of, of restraint and, and morality and community because they've been seduced um, by the populist trappings of modernity. And that, that's the demon of greed there, but it might as well be Taksin Shinawat. Um, because he was the great populist seducer um, for the rural people in Thailand. Um, so, so in this analysis, in this too modern analysis, um, old style patronage has now been replaced by the modern populist patronage of the state. So what's the solution if they're too modern? If they're too modern, I suppose the solution is to make them a bit less modern. Um, and here's a classic illustration of this. This is from the, from the Thai king. Um, who has many wise thoughts about how other people should live their lives. And one of his prescriptions is, is this notion of sufficiency economy um, that tells people they should go back to basic self-sufficiency, to growing their own crops, um, not to becoming middle class and, and well-paid workers, um, but to rebuild democracy, in a sense, from the bottom up, um, built on a foundation of, of community-based production, um, local wisdom and community-based morality. So we've got these two stories about, about these, these problematic rural people. On the one hand, they're not modern enough um, and they take money for votes because they're, they're poor and dominated by local patrons. On the other hand, they're too modern um, and they take money for votes because they've been seduced by the lure um, of extravagance and modernity. Now, my feeling is that, that in the tension between these two positions, even though I don't really agree with either, in the tension between them, um, there's some insight into what's really going on with, with issues like vote buying in Thailand. And, and the way I word this is I think the explanation to, to vote buying in its current phenomenon lies in the political challenges of middle-income rural Thailand. 
And let me explain what I mean by that. And I'm going to put together, put forward three propositions, and I've put these in red, um, not because I am red, um, but because I, I really want you to pay attention to them. Um, the first proposition is peasants in Thailand are for the most part no longer poor. They're middle income peasants. Now I think this is fundamentally important for understanding contemporary Thai politics. Now why are they middle income peasants? Don't have to focus on these. Largely they've benefited from Thailand's extraordinary economic growth. You can see GDP per capita there for Thailand and a few other countries that we might be interested in. Um, Thailand is now classified as an upper middle income economy by the World Bank. Rural people have benefited from this economic growth. If we look at some basic social indicators, rural poverty has dropped dramatically, infant mortality has dropped dramatically, primary school completion is now universal, um, the UNDP's Millennium Development Goals have been effectively achieved in a few years ahead of schedule. If we look at some basic income figures, just expressing people's in average income as a percentage of the, of, of the poverty line, we can see rural people on average earn three times the poverty line, 320%. Even people who in rural systems are usually regarded as the poorest and most vulnerable agricultural workers on average earn double the poverty line. So by and large, by and large, some exceptions, Thailand has solved the problem of absolute poverty in rural areas. Very important point. But they now face the challenge of relative poverty, inequality. And my second key assertion is that national economic disparity or inequality, relative poverty, um, is a result of the relatively low productivity of agriculture. Now, just a quick look at Thailand's disparity problem. This is figures from, from the UNDP. Um, red, relatively poor areas, blue, relatively richer areas. You can see that's those big rural areas of the north and the northeast that are relatively less well off. Um, look at the results of the last election. Red, where Thaksin slash Yingluck's party won. Um, you can see, you don't have to do too much analysis, there's a very clear correlation here between um, disparity and political allegiances. Now here's some figures which I really think, they, they may seem a bit dull, but I think they have really profound importance for understanding politics in Thailand and other countries in the world. You can see over the last 40 or 50 years, the percentage of agriculture's mm. contribution to GDP has dropped to only 11% in Thailand. But the percentage of the workforce has dropped, but much less. You now have 40%, 39% of the workforce producing 11% of GDP. In other words, labour outside agriculture is more than five times as productive as labour within agriculture. Now, this is, this is a really core political dynamic in Thailand. What, what it's about is not really about the disappearance of the peasantry that's driving a lot of political tension. It's the maintenance, it's the endurance of that large segment of the labour force still involved in relatively low productive activities in the agricultural sector. And I think that's a, that's a real key aspect of what's going on in the politics of Thailand. Now my third key claim, which, which starts to bring us back closer to the issue of corruption and vote buying, is that the Thai state now plays a central role in supporting the rural economy. The Thai state has had to respond to these issues of disparity, has had to respond to previous issues of rural poverty, and has done this by spending a hell of a lot more money on agricultural development and rural development more generally. And here's another graph, sorry about all the graphs, but I do like them sometimes. Um, this, is, this shows your, your real growth in agricultural expenditure by the government um, from the 1960s to the 2000s. Um, it's like a 15-fold increase in, in real terms over that period. Now, this, this to me is a profound fiscal transformation in Thailand. And here I'll put two arguments. You can take your choice which one you like. First is my strong argument, which probably needs a little bit more research to, to really confirm. But my strong argument is the Thai state now puts more into rural communities than it extracts. 
used to tax farmers, now it subsidises them. This is a very common transformation as countries move into this middle income status. It occurs in many areas. If you want a more cautious version of that argument, it would be in public perception, the Thai state now puts more into rural communities than it extracts. And when you're talking about politics, I suppose it's public perceptions that are more important than the actual fiscal realities. Um, so essentially, the Thai state is now a subsidiser of the rural economy. Now, what does all this mean for, for politics and corruption and the issues I started talking about? Let, let, let me try to sum up here with, with, with a quote what I see as the key political dynamic of this middle income peasantry that's emerged in Thailand. This is a bit self-indulgent. It's a quote from my own book that hasn't even been published yet. So, but here we go. It sums up the argument well, I think. Among Thailand's peasants, the primary livelihood challenge has moved away from food security, the old classic peasant challenge, to the middle income challenges of diversification, productivity and disparity. The core political dynamic for this middle income peasantry is not minimising surplus extraction, but maximising state subsidy. It's no longer the intrusive presence of the state that is likely to pr prompt resistance, but on the contrary, the state's disinterest absence or for forced withdrawal. Now, now, now here, if I was to sum up this political dynamic, I, I like to take a term from um, anthropologist of, of South Asia, um, Partha Chatterjee, who talks about this idea of political society. And, and for him, this political society is based on the productive, the productive intersection between peasant politics and the governing practices of the modern state. Um, so this idea of political society suggests that local political identities are not some remnants of some pre-modern era, or, or they're not resistant identities attempting to battle with the state, um, but rather they're, they're the product of an engagement between all the state's livelihood and subsidies and classification schemes and the political aspirations of the peasantry itself. Um, and this is what I'm calling political society here, um, adapting this idea a little bit. Uh, and in, in rural Thailand, I think this political society, this collaborative relationship between the peasantry and the state um, is typified by three things. Very strong interpersonal connections, between local communities and state officials, um, locally specific negotiations and transactions and exchanges rather than some notion of universal rights and benefits, and, and forms of identity um, that are based on both legibility, making themselves legible to the state, but also on eligibility, on making sure local communities are eligible for state subsidy. So that's enough, enough sociological theory. What does all this mean for vote buying? Um, have I had my five minutes yet? Or not? You don't have to give it to me if I haven't, but just not sure where I am. Um, so I've got a few minutes just to, to really make three key points about vote buying. My first point is, in this context of this new rural dynamic, of this new political society, um, the distribution of cash, which I'd rather call it the distribution of cash than vote buying, symbolises a willingness and ability to promote local development. Development in rural Thailand has become a dominant political value and, and it's often expressed through activities like this. This, this is what people in Thailand call a project. Um, and this, this is actually a, a fertiliser production project. And these projects are everywhere. When I visit rural areas in Thailand, people say to me, Andrew, have you bought a project? Um, and projects are local development initiatives that are usually funded by some outside source. And these have become a real core preoccupation of politics, local politics um, in rural Thailand. And, and they encapsulate really complex series of negotiations and transactions about private benefit versus public good. 
Most of these men will be deriving some private benefit from these projects, as well as contributing to a broader public good. Um, in a sense, these projects are, are what we might call microcosms of corruption um, in Thailand. This, this is real grassroots corruption. People get involved in these projects for, for all sorts of reasons. And, and my key point here is that politicians have to show that they can participate in this particular moral economy. They have to show that they can mobilise resources and they can distribute resources because this is really the underpinning uh, of an economy that has become heavily dependent on state subsidy. And the distribution of cash before elections is a symbolically powerful way that electoral candidates can do this. So, first point here, in political society, distribution of cash is an important political symbol. Second point, distribution of cash is embedded in local networks of exchange and evaluation. Now, if you read studies of vote buying from all over the world, they, they often come up against a, an analytical problem, and that is, that they call it the compliance problem. And essentially, the compliance problem is, if I give you money to vote for me, how do I know you actually did vote for me? Um, especially in the context of a secret ballot. Um, now, there's various technical ways you can solve this compliance problem by getting voters to take a photo of the ballot paper with their mobile phone and things like this, and these things do occur, but they tend to have, get pretty expensive and cumbersome. And, and what most analysts end up concluding is that politicians solve this problem by embedding vote buying in personal networks. And in, and in local systems of exchange, and they, they typically do this, this through local vote brokers. Um, so essentially what, what these analysts of vote buying are admitting is that what we're talking about here is not really buying at all, it's not really the purchasing of a commodity, but the giving of a gift. Um, and I think if we can start to understand vote buying as the giving of a gift, um, then that opens the way for us to consider the various systems of evaluation that regulate gift giving. Um, and in this particular political society in rural Thailand, I've described these systems of evaluation as, as comprising what I call um, a rural constitution. And this rural constitution makes certain judgments about what sorts of monetary distribution are socially credible. Um, if they're not socially credible, if they're not socially embedded, they won't work. One final point about vote buying, it has political effect. Coming back to that image that we saw from the election earlier this year. Vilifying the capability and the morality of rural voters and their electoral representatives has been a long-standing strategy of anti-democratic forces in Thailand. This is their standard, standard modus operandi. Um, and the preoccupation with vote buying um, in Thailand over the last two decades has, has paralleled the decline of, of the elite and royalist Democrat Party, um, who have shown themselves over the last two elections, the party of former Prime Minister Abhisit, totally incapable of winning a free and fair election. Um, the Democrat and other members of the elite and members of civil society in Thailand simply can't come to grips with the transformations that have taken place in rural Thailand. So they've resorted to, to a default discourse which is about morality, community and good governance. Um, and in this sense, it's a fundamentally undemocratic discourse. So let me finish just by reading a quote from, from Partha Chatterjee about political society. And he talks about precisely what's been happening in, in Thailand over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, the complaint is widespread in middle-class circles today that politics has been taken over by mobs and criminals, by the importation of the disorderly, corrupt and irrational practices of unreformed popular culture into the very hallways and chambers of civic life, all because of the calculations of electoral expediency. The noble pursuit of modernity appears to have been seriously compromised because of the compulsions of parliamentary democracy. 
Um, and these are exactly the complaints we've heard echoed in Thailand, which were used to justify the coup against Prime Minister Thaksin, which have been used to justify military rule that have linked up with all sorts of royalist and elitist discourses in Thailand. Um, I suppose my message to those in Thailand and to those in other countries who, who rely on this sort of condemnation of political society is, well, you're just going to have to get used to it. Um, rural society has fundamentally changed. You have a large, electorally significant rural population and they're going to exercise very significant influence on democratic systems for some time to come. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sen has a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago, so he has the academic credentials for this sort of enterprise, but probably more appropriate for what we're talking about this afternoon. He was for more than 10 years a senior journalist and a senior assistant editor of the Times of India, India's largest selling English language newspaper. And from that perspective, he's acquired a, a wonderful overview of modern political and democratic practices in India. So again, very well equipped to continue this discussion and maintain the theme of democracy development that we've already embarked on with the two papers we've heard. Um, the title is the Anahazari movement and its implications for Indian democracy. If Anahazari is a new term to you, Dr. Sen will explain it to you and uh, you'll leave the room uh, both in informed and entertained, I think, in hearing his uh, analysis of Anna Hazari. So, Dr. Sen. Thanks, Robin, for the kind introduction. Uh, there's a real resonance uh, from Andrew's uh, paper uh, with mine, since the stimulus to Anna Hazari's movement was really corruption. What I'll do here is uh, briefly discuss three sets of issues about the Anna Hazari movement. First, why and how did Anna Hazari, a relatively uh, unknown person before 2011, galvanize such impressive support for his movement. Two, what has been the immediate impact on Indian democracy and civil society? And three, what is the future of the movement? Some of you might have had an overdose uh, of the coverage of Anna Hazare, but for the sake of those who didn't, uh, I'll just familiarize you briefly with who Anna Hazare is. Here's an early picture of Hazare. Uh, he was a soldier in the Indian Army for roughly 15 years or so before he retired and began doing social work in his native village in the western state of Maharashtra, a place called Ralega Siddhi. Uh, it was a drought-prone region of Maharashtra. And this is a, sort of a more current picture of Hazare in his uh, village in Ralega and Siddhi. Uh, the transformation from a khaki-clad soldier to uh, you know, dhoti-clad Gandhian is quite remarkable, but in the Indian context, not so much, if you sort of consider the example of Mahatma Gandhi himself, who in his early days, we see his pictures as, as a suited and booted barrister, and, and his later pictures, in a way, described by Churchill as a half-naked fakir. Hazari has done some very good work in his village, uh, putting in place rainwater harvesting systems. Uh, since, as I mentioned, uh, his uh, village is uh, you know, part of a drought-prone area. Uh, what is less known is that he's also uh, conducted an anti-alcoholism campaign in his uh, area and he sort of rid the, his village and the environment and the surrounding area of uh, people having alcohol. Um, it was at, uh, earlier reported that you know, um, some of the methods he used were quite severe, where recalcitrants were apparently beaten up if they uh, didn't give up alcohol. But now Anna Hazar himself has confirmed in a recent interview, I think, a couple of years ago, that uh, what his uh, method was that he would give three warnings to uh, people who sort of had alcohol or, or, what, or uh, he terms them alcoholics. And if they didn't give up alcohol, they were tied to a tree and flogged. Uh, but what really brought Anna Hazare into the limelight were his campaigns against corruption uh, from the early 1990s. In 1991, he formed what is known as the Bhrashtachar Virodhi Jan Andolan. Bhrashtachar being the Hindi word for corruption. Andolan is also the Hindi word for campaign. He also extensively campaigned for the Right to Information Act, uh, which was uh, later promulgated by the central government around 2005. And his campaign even forced two Maharashtra government 
ministers to resign in roughly, I think, around 1996. This was also the time he started using the fast unto death or the hunger strike as, as a potent tool. People often sometimes forget that the Indian state has actually awarded him two very high civilian honors, the Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan. So the state also has recognized the worth of his work in, in, in Maharashtra. But when he really hit the big time was with his fast in April 2011, uh, when he demanded the setting up of a Lokpal or an anti-corruption ombudsman, which was first mooted as early as 1966 and tabled in parliament in 1968 and has been kept in cold storage since. Anna and four members of his team, who are now sort of known as Team Anna, were taken on board to draft the Lokpal bill, itself a very unusual move by the government, until the talks broke down on certain sticking points. The question is, why has Hazare struck such a chord among the people? The first is obviously the issue that is taken up, corruption, something that affects almost everyone in India, and has been in the public eye in recent times very much because of large-scale scams uh, from the end of 2010, the 2G scam, the Commonwealth scam, etc. The government response to Anna Hazare's movement uh, in 2011 was ham-handed. So they bungled in by arresting Hazare even before he began his fast. This was exploited by Hazare and probably helped in generating much larger protests than originally might have happened. Whatever the impression Hazare might give him of himself as a, as a simple Gandhian, he and his associates, again, as I said, known as Team Anna, obviously knew how to plug into the right symbols. So the fast at the Ramlila ground, and here we have a picture here, was done before a huge portrait of Mahatma Gandhi in the backdrop. So he was definitely plugging in to sort of the legacy of Gandhi. And of course, fasting itself has strong Gandhian connotations. There were divisive symbols too. There was a picture of Bharat Mata, uh, which has sort of a Hinduized tinge to it, on the Ramlila ground. And the almost sort of daily raising slogans of Bharat Mata ki jai, etc., which led some people to see strains of Hindu nationalism in the movement. There was also support at various points from the Yuga Guru, Baba Ramdev, and the spiritual guru, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, and their vast network of followers across India. But Hazare and his team also showed that they were fairly adept at damage control. So when Anna Hazare broke his fast, uh, which lasted for 13 days, he actually had a Muslim girl and a Dalit, uh, an untouchable girl, give him coconut water to break his fast, to manufacture a moment was really made for television. Moreover, Team Anna had people like a former police officer, senior police officer, Kiran Bedi, a lawyer, Prashant Bhushan, uh, 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 an RTI activist called Ar Arvind Kejriwal, who runs uh, an NGO, all of whom, of whom were able to sort of speak the language of the middle class and articulate the disgust with the political class that was widespread in India. This was again an event which was relentlessly covered by the media and beamed into drawing rooms of urban India. And this figure that we have here uh, shows some of the figures for the 141, actually we now have 141 news channels in India, which is itself an incredible figure, which showed a real spike in, in, in viewership. And this was only second to the, the Mumbai terror attacks in 2008. So you can sort of compare the, 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 the spike in viewership that this, uh, the Anahar movement brought about. And one important thing to note is that this wasn't just restricted to the urban, you know, the big metros. In the, it was also a, a phenomenon in the tier two and tier three cities. There were also newspapers, uh, like the Times of India, where I earlier worked for, which actually took up the Amna um, movement as a campaign. Uh, here I have another slide which actually shows there was increased coverage of corruption itself as an issue across all mediums, uh, you know, television, newspapers, as well as the radio. In 2011, a real spike in, in 2011 and then peaking in 2011. And you know, there are sort of comparative figures for uh, Anna Hazare and Baba Ramdev in, in, in some of the prominent newspapers, both English and Hindi, as well as uh, some of the channels. So what was the Im immediate impact of, of this movement? The first was, of course, the fast tracking of the, uh, of the local bill. 
uh, which uh, was you know, introduced in Parliament and is uh, going to be debated in, in the current session of, uh, of Parliament, the winter session, which started yesterday. While one can quibble with the methods that Anna Hazare employed and its legitimacy, that is a fast time to death, it is also true that uh, hunger strikes have not been unusual in independent India. And unlike Anna Hazare, there actually have been activists who've you know, died after going on hunger strikes. So, so in that sense, it's not unusual. Uh, what happened in the last session, that is the monsoon session of parliament, uh, was that a sense of the house resolution was passed on the last day on three points raised by Team Anna. One was putting the lower bureaucracy under the Lokpal, establishment of Loka Yukta or a, a Lokpal-like institution in all states with central funding, and a citizen's charter. This sense of resolution passed in the house eventually enabled the ending of Hazare's fast. At present, the government version of the Lokpal, is being, uh, Lokpal bill is being considered by the Standing Committee for Law and Justice, which now has till December 7th to table its report. It seems, now this is again speculation, you know, we don't really, you know, there's uh, uh, been no public statements made by the committee itself, but, uh, you know, some of the, the, the members of the committee have spoken off the record to journalists, and it seems that some of the demands of Team Anna has been met, but uh, not all of them, including, you know, one is whether the Prime Minister will be under the ambit of the local. Another sticking issue is whether all bureaucrats, you know, across the grades, you know, the government, uh, I think the committee is open to including the senior bureaucrats, but uh, Team Anna wants uh, each and every uh, government servant put under the local. So these are some of the sticking issues. Another significant impact is uh, the, the, you know, the people who supported the movement which were the middle classes, uh, substantially. And significantly, these are people who don't take to the streets normally uh, uh, to protest. Though many of them were not well versed in the intricacies of the local bill itself, the, the patriotism question was very high, and here we have a picture of a Hazare supporter at Ramlila Maidan. And there was also a, a, a strong identification with what I would call as brand Anna. So these you know, Anna caps became quite popular. Um, all over India. But the response again was uneven in, in I think Delhi, Mumbai, got larger crowds, you know, places like Kolkata, uh, Hyderabad were less affected. So, so there was an uneven uh, 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 impact of the Anna Hazari movement of India, on, on, on India as a whole. I think eventually it was the one point agenda of a powerful institution like the Lokpal, which would bypass normal procedures to eradicate corruption that appeal to the middle classes, who believe in an efficient or technocratic solutions that sometimes often veer towards authoritarianism. Hence their faith in the local bill of Team Anna and the reverence for Anna. It would be premature to predict, as the International Herald Tribune did very recently, uh, I think last week, calling, uh, the, uh, terming this whole phenomenon as a Goliath that has awakened, the Goliath being the middle classes whose numbers very widely, depending on in how we calculate it. As a class, the middle class remains heterogeneous, and that's a point we should uh, keep in mind. But here are a couple of uh, interesting statistics from uh, a Pew survey, which was done before the, the, the uh, Anhazare movement and the, the big scandals hit India. This was uh, in early 2010. And what we have is a picture, and this is, I think, uh, it was done in the four cities, uh, uh, Delhi, Mumbai, Calcutta, and Madras, and possibly Bangalore, not a uh, very uh, large sample size uh, as part of the Pew Global Attitudes Project. And we have here a very sort of rosy picture that the middle classes have of the economy. And this is again in a pre pre uh, uh, corruption scandals. And again, this is another one which sort of s sees the middle class very confident of, of seeing India as, as, a, as eventually becoming a world power. So what is the sort of future trajectory of the movement, or, 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 or you know, if we can sort of make some sort of general predictions? One is uh, you know, whether and how far the middle classes will continue to remain more engaged in politics beyond the issue of corruption. That remains to be seen. Regarding the Hazari movement, it is at a real crossroads, uh, and there are some doubts whether it can outlast its original uh, anti-corruption agenda. 
Of course, this is not the first time uh, that people have come together to challenge the establishment on the issue of corruption. Perhaps the best example is a movement led by Jay Prakash Narayan, or JP, as he was known, in 1974, just before Indira Gandhi imposed emergency in 1975. JP, too, had raised the issue of Lokpal and talked about a precipitous fall of moral standards in public life. These are, of course, very different times, uh, and people across the globe have raised their voices against a government. And uh, here we have a poster from the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. But I would argue that the Anna movement is very different from something like the Occupy Wall Street movement, in the sense that uh, the, the movements like the Occupy Wall Street movement or the ones that we are seeing in uh, various European capitals are far more spontaneous and don't have a real core leadership as such, whereas it's very different in, 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 in the case of Anna Hazare, where there's a core team which is sort of directing the movement. Also, comparisons with the Arab Spring is far-fetched since these protests were against brutal dictatorships, whereas you know, here we have a movement which is in a vibrant democracy, and even though Anna Hazare gets arrested, he, uh, you know, his, uh, his movement is free to do pretty much you know, what they want. And so there's, you know, despite the sort of initial bungling by the government, I don't think the government has really sort of cracked down uh, in that sense on, on the movement. Another vital difference is that Team Anna has begun flirting with uh, conventional electoral politics. Uh, a core member of the team, Arvind Kejriwal, actually campaigned against the Congress in a, in a recent by-elections in the northern state of Haryana, which uh, neighbors Delhi. Uh, though the Anna Hazare movement you know, uh, does not have the wherewithal or the organization to contest elections, by entering the poll arena, the movement, I think, risks being seen as partisan or at least allying itself with the opposition. Besides, key members of the, uh, the Anna movement have been embroiled in different sets of controversies into which I, I don't want to go into. All this has had the effect of taking some sheen off the movement and having possibly alienated some of its supporters. And here uh, I have uh, some figures from a, a survey conducted by Hindustan Times, which is a, a big newspaper in Delhi. Again, the caveat is you know, a very sam small sample survey, as is the case with a lot of these newspaper surveys, uh, again, uh, restricted to, to uh, the Delhi, and in, in this case, only Delhi and Mumbai. And it's sort of interesting, the, 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 the support for Team Anna seems to have you know, radically diminished, according to the survey. Although people feel that the government is targeting its members, you know, mostly by sort of maybe planting news reports about corruption, etc., about individual members. But the third finding is actually quite interesting, that 60% uh, feel that Team Anna should actually float a political party, uh, which is uh, a food for thought. On the question of the Lokpal, it is, I think, quite well accepted that it won't be a panacea for tackling corruption. It could be one of the many systemic reforms that could take on graft in India, but there are valid concerns about whether a Leviathan like Lokpal is the right way to go about things rather than enforcing existing laws and strengthening existing institutions. Besides the culture of corruption, where uh, most Indians are a part of willy-nilly, you know, as a bribe giver or a bribe taker, is the one area that will be most difficult to tackle in, 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 uh, by way of such a sort of supra uh, body. Now, I have no expertise in South Asia, but as a, a nod to you know, the, 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 the general overarching theme of the uh, uh, conference, uh, this is a map you know, from the, the, the Corruption Perception Index of, of Transparency International, uh, 2010, where you see that um, you know, the, the areas in sort of uh, marked in sort of orange and red are sort of the countries which sort of uh, are, are the more corrupt ones in the middle. And there's one dot that's missing, you know, that's Singapore, which is you know, the least corrupt, but it doesn't show up, unfortunately, on this uh, map. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it would be interesting to see you know, if there is any taste for a local-like institution in, in uh, you know, this entire area, which is, uh, which is sort of regarded as you know, most or more corrupt, you know, depending on, on, uh, and, uh, on, and this is actually the, 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 the rankings where you, know, you have Singapore, 
along with two other Scandinavian countries at the top. Uh, but the rest, including India, many of them are sort of very much in the sort of middle level. Myanmar is sort of an outlier, you know, right at the, at the bottom. And more generally, to conclude, uh, it's a question of credibility of politicians, I think, which is a real issue now. Uh, all over the world, including India, I think it's hit an all-time low. Uh, in the case of India, we really have to see whether uh, India's politicians and India's parliament can regain credibility by debating and passing legislation, which means not just the local bill, which is before parliament, but there are several other pending bills, uh, including you know, land reform, judicial accountability, etc., you know, pension. And you know, we had the first day of parliament yesterday. It wasn't very encouraging because it got adjourned during question hour uh, on the issue of uh, you know, uh, one of the bigger states of India, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, there's a proposal to divide it up into four parts. So there was a lot of slogan shouting and I mean, uh, a, a lot of ruckus. The house got adjourned. I'm not sure how it's progressing today, but um, so, so the, I think there's a real need for the political class to get its act together. Conversely, uh, you know, again, this applies not to just India, but across the world. Can we see sort of any real alternatives to the established political formations? You know, we, uh, the survey which we saw earlier does uh, show that you know, a certain number of people believe that uh, you know, Anna Hazare and his compatriots should float a party. But where, you know, experiments like this uh, haven't proved too successful. Uh, uh, you know, they, they have lacked the finances, they have lacked the wherewithal. So there's a question as to, you know, if we distrust politicians and conventional political formation, you know, what's, what, what, what is the alternative to that? Thank you. The first question to uh, Dr. Singh. Why India is so club since it has a, a long democracy? Uh, the second question to Dr. Will. Walker. Uh, Walker, and why Thailand cannot uh, control the vote buying? It means that why vote buying in Thailand is out of control. Mm. And how about the uh, election outcome if without vote buying. And the last question to uh, uh, Dr. Salawan uh, Narmuto uh, is that uh, to what extent the foreign investment in Sri Lanka affect its domestic uh, political and economy? Thank you. Thank you. For Dr. Walker, uh, is corruption in Thailand the worst case in Southeast Asia? How does it compare with Sri Lanka? Is Thaksin's corruption any worse or better than individuals among the yellow shirts, the military, and the royal cotry? For Dr. Sen, can you briefly compare the Anna Hazari movement to the movement initiated by VP Singh. Thank you. I think we might, we've got five questions running at the moment. We might deal with those five and then move to another batch. So um, would the comparative corruption question be a good one to begin with, perhaps? The uh, uh, Sri Lankan and Thai question. Andrew, can we ask you to um, perhaps? Is corruption in Thailand the worst in Southeast Asia? I'm not sure. Um, certainly not worse than Burma. Um, we saw the rankings up there on, on the board a minute ago, so I suppose I'd be willing to defer to those. Um, I, I think, and perhaps this relates also to the question about why is vote buying so out of control um, in Thailand. My argument is essentially that in a sense, it's not vote buying or corruption that's out of control. It's the, the anti-democratic discourse of vote buying and corruption that's out of control. So let me put that another way. If, if we want to look 
if we want to rank the threats to democracy in Thailand, um, I would rank vote buying pretty low. Um, I don't think there's any serious evidence that um, Thaksin wouldn't have been elected in 2001, 2005, 2006, and a Thaksin ally in 2007 and 2011. It's a pretty consistent series of results. I don't think there's any evidence that that wouldn't have happened um, if there hadn't been cash distributed before elections. Um, the fact is all parties do it, um, even the very pure Democrat party, people might be shocked to hear also, um, distribute money before elections. Um, and as I said in my presentation, my feeling is that you know, many, many voters, the majority of voters, subject these distributions to all sorts of electoral evaluations. Um, you can't buy votes, um, you distribute gifts and that might have political effect. Um, now, why is this discourse of corruption out of control in Thailand? Um, one of the reasons, I think, is that we have in Thailand a, a, a monarch, a king, who, who, who occupies such a central ideological position. Um, and in terms of threats to democracy, I think this is, this is an important, um, a key institution, because the image of an incorruptible king um, has been consistently used um, to attack democratic processes, electoral processes, um, the characters of elected politicians. Um, so one of the reasons people are so preoccupied with corruption in Thailand is that they have this ideologically potent point of comparison, and that is the king. Um, and my feeling is when we get the next king on the throne in Thailand, that point of comparison will be much less potent um, because he hasn't got a very good reputation and we will probably see concern with corruption in Thailand decline significantly. Yeah, the question was the extent to which foreign investment affects domestic political economy. If you accept the argument that FDI is a very decisive component in the whole argument with regard to takeoff, then it has a very decisive impact because the, at the end of the day, the ability of the regime to sustain itself in power is going to depend almost, you know, very fundamentally on its ability to deal with economic demands as opposed to political demands at the end of the day, particularly after the end of the war and the expectation of a peace dividend, uh, particularly amongst the majority community. But there are instances in which, for example, um, foreign direct investment which takes place uh, against the wishes of people in terms of in a particular area or with uh, a considerable impact on the environment. For example, uh, only in the last uh, week or so, there was information that came out that an American company that was investing in growing bananas in a particular part of the country, there was a lot of... Uh, um, uh, protests about that on environmental grounds, etc., and they withdrew. So it depends very much in terms of how the population perceives it as being of some benefit to them or not. I mean, if you look at our current situation, uh, Sri Lanka is putting a lot of emphasis on tourism. We are hoping to get 2.5 million tourists by 2015-2016 according to some projections, that requires us building some 35,000 hotel rooms, um, which is a major, considerable construction effort going to have to take, <laughs> well, whatever. Uh, we need FDI to do it. We need FDI to do it. Uh, there are seven-star hotels and five-star hotels coming up, but I think in terms of the trickle-down impact as, and the economic and political dividend, you need the FDI. Yeah, yeah um, I had, I think, two questions that were addressed to me. One by uh, Professor Wong. Um, as I think it was quite evident from Andrew's uh, presentation, you know, democracy and corruption can very much go hand in hand, and a lot of the corruption is electoral corruption um, in the case of India, too. You know, some of the things that you mentioned, you know, money being doled out, other, other sort of SOPs. 
So, so, so that's the problem. But also, I think, uh, you know, I think corruption has a lot to do with, you know, how much of a role uh, this is, the state is playing in, 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 the, in the lives of the citizens. And in, if for each and every step, be it for a you know, birth, birth certificate or a, or a driving license, uh, each time a citizen has to interact with a, a government servant who's often, you know, very poorly paid, I think each transaction entails a sort of uh, a, you know, either speed money or uh, some sort of corruption. I think so that's kind of the endemic corruption that we're talking about in India. Besides, of course, these sort of, you know, real mega scams which, uh, which can occur, I think, uh, uh, you know, democracy or otherwise, and even in China, I think, is not immune to, uh, you know, we had the, uh, I guess it was the railway minister who was sort of charged with, uh, so I think, um, you know, corruption itself probably doesn't have so much to do you know, with the system itself. And uh, the question about comparing Anna Hazari to VP Singh, I think VP Singh, you know, the challenge was, you know, he was a politician, you know, a congressman who broke away. So it was a challenge, you know, a, a sort of attempt at reform from within the confines of the sort of the conventional uh, Indian political system. And, you know, he tried to sort of uh, reform it from within. While here, it's very much uh, what you might loosely call, I think, uh, a civil society challenge, you know. Anna Hazari has, you know, his, or his uh, compatriots accepting one, they really never had any, any sort of party affiliations. So the challenge is really from outside the conventional party system. So I think that's the real basic difference. And Professor, uh, you didn't mention anything about the, there was once this often talked about 13th Amendment. Uh, my question is very simple. How serious is the Sri Lankan government in inducting the 13th Amendment, uh, especially in the area of uh, uh, giving political rights to the minority Tamils. Thank you. Professor Harris. I'm John Harris from, from ISAS. Um, I too would like to take advantage of Dr. Saravanopadu's presence to uh, try to sort of uh, uh, catch up a little bit with, with uh, the state of affairs in, in, in Sri Lanka. Um, first off, I'd like to know a little bit more about, if you could say a little bit more about the state of the opposition um, in, uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka. You, know, you mentioned the, the historic vibrancy of, uh, of, of, Sh of Sri Lankan politics. I, I'm a little sort of uh, curious, to, I, I don't know enough about what has happened to, uh, to the opposition, to the family sort of, uh, sort of thing. Um, secondly, I wonder if you could actually tell us a little bit more about what in, in, in your understanding is actually happening uh, in the north and, and northeast. Um, I, and, and really, thirdly, I, I, I wonder if you could sort of uh, perhaps sketch out for us a little bit what, what you think and those you work with, what you think should be the shape of a, of a political settlement. A political settlement which would really give the, the Tamils a, a place in, in Sri, Lankan, Sri Lankan society, um, something about which I, I must confess to feeling uh, very considerable pessimism uh, myself. Um, secondly, if I may, I'd like to just address one or two comments really to, uh, to, to Andrew Walker. I mean, I'm very interested in your picking up of, uh, of Parthu Chatterjee's notion of, uh, of, of political society. Uh, I mean, Chatterjee starts off by in his discussion of political society and civil society uh, by arguing that the great, the great majority of, of Indians don't actually enjoy the rights of citizenship uh, and they're in a sense relegated to political society. So I wonder if you could say something about that part of the analysis. Uh, to what extent do those whom you see as being part of a political society uh, in, in Thailand actually enjoy uh, rights of, of, of citizenship? And then, if I may just sort of comment briefly, without going on at huge length, but, you know, I think that, you know, Chatterjee builds up too, too stark and too simple a dichotomy between political society and civil society. And in the interstices of some of his, of some of his writing, he does, you know, recognize that there are those who are, in a sense, building a civil society in the, in the context of, of, of political society. There is a kind of an alternative kind of organizing um, in, in 
the sphere of, of political society that is working towards a sort of transformative politics. Do you see any prospects of, of that kind um, in, in, in Thailand? I, I, you know, I'm really looking, perhaps rather desperately, uh, in the light of the rather pessimistic kinds of uh, remarks that I, or pessimistic conclusions that I think are, are coming out, for me anyway, of your analysis as out of uh, Rana Joy's sense about the prospects uh, for, for democracy and the prospects for a kind of progressive transformative politics that would actually realize development sans uh, Amartya Sen, de development as, as freedom rather than just as economic growth. Um, whether there are any prospects of, the, of that kind in, uh, in, uh, in, in Thailand? Uh, asking you really to, if you could put something in the scales against the rather pessimistic picture that you painted for me. Professor Walker, uh, uh, since uh, 1958, uh, since Field Marshal Sarit Thanarat, uh, 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 the army, the armed forces in Thailand has, if not uh, been, a, and their relatives, if not been a class, certainly a so, uh, Weberian category in, in the Thai political system. One would have thought by now a model would have evolved whereby the army would have intervened at some point in time, backed a probably a civilian uh, government, and addressed this, uh, this, uh, 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 this uh, electoral corruption uh, aggressively by now. Why hasn't that happened in Thailand? Uh, to Rana Joy, um, uh, how would you compare this to, uh, say, in Pakistan, uh, Imran Khan's the Tehrike Insaf, which, uh, though it's a mainstream political party, doesn't have a seat in parliament, but increasingly becoming some kind of a movement like, uh, like uh, Anna Hazare. Uh, in the subcontinent, uh, 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 as of, I mean, in recent times, political, emerging political parties are no longer class or ideological based. They may be cause based. And in both cases, both Imran Khan's and, and Anna Hazare's, we see the cause as a major uh, social cause being an effective foundation of a political party. And I see 62% of Indians think that Anna Hazare's movement should be a political party, which uh, Tariq and Saf already is. Uh, let me deal with the questions pertaining to the 13th Amendment and the shape of a political settlement. As people may or may not know, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of Sri Lanka came on the heels of the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord in 1987. And what the 13th Amendment did was to pave the way for the introduction of a system of provincial devolution, a system of provincial councils. It did two other things as well. One was to merge the north and eastern provinces into the northeast province, but that's been subsequently demerged. And it also paved the way for Tamil, the language of the second largest uh